Many times I start off this show with this rig as a piece of firefighting history. But this fire engine today truly is a piece of firefighting history. It's a 1982 LaFrance Salisbury hose wagon. It served the FDNY's Maxi Water Unit 207. It originally served in Brooklyn as part of the Maxi Water System. It's outfitted with Stortz intakes and would respond with two additional engine companies to provide the needed water flow capacity. It's equipped with a 10 kilowatt gas generator, a 2,500 gallon per minute fixed monitor, 1,250 gallon per minute portable monitor, and 180 gallons of foam concentrate. As a satellite unit, it is a special fire vehicle equipped with extra four and a half inch large diameter hose, six inch diameter suction hose, foam agent, and a high volume deluge gun to support the operations of the other fire units on scene. These satellite units would respond as part of the second alarm response, and this one also responded to first alarms in Staten Island. This unit served the FDNY from 1982 to 1993, and one of the last responses was to the World Trade Center bombing in 93. After it was retired from service in the FDNY, it served in Long Hill, Connecticut from 93 to 2015, and then it was donated to the Terry Farrell Firefighters Fund of Georgia, where it's used at special events to fund the scholarship in memory of Terry Farrell from the FDNY that died on the island. This rig is truly a piece of fire service history. Hi everybody, I'm Jess Penalty. Welcome back to another episode of Firefighters and Fire Trucks Getting Ice Cream. Today I'm out at the uh, Metro Atlanta Firefighters Conference, uh, teaching out here in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta, and I'm uh, going to pick up Sean Gray from Cobb County Fire. Talk about all kinds of cool stuff with him, uh, so stay tuned. Man. Hey man, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. I like the flip flops all the way. Thanks. That's yeah. good <laughs> you want to get some ice cream? Yeah, let's do it. All right. All right. So, what's been going on, man? Nothing, man. How about you? <laughs> Same old, same old. Yeah. Just cruising through it all. Yeah, I love the rig. Uh, I, I love the rig too. Uh, yeah. Another one of those just great finds. I mean, making calls on these things and everybody's like, yeah, sure, here's the keys. You can drive to go get ice cream. It's just, it's yeah. a lot easier now that the show's been around for two years sure. to get them. But at the beginning, it was like, you, you want to do what with my, yeah. but yeah, it's it's been a fun yeah, ride, man. You know, uh, so we've been fortunate here in Georgia with the Terry Farrell Firefighters Fund. And uh, which we have a Georgia chapter here um, after 9-11 that we established and had to raise money for firefighters and firefighters families. Yeah. And, uh, and so having a rig like this has been donated, obviously from FDNY to the Terry Fund. I know, that's so crazy. And then, yeah, and then they, you know, they sent it out to their Georgia chapter. So we had another rig that was from Roslyn Heights uh, in Long Island. Okay. And uh, it was a little bit more, it was beat up a little bit. <laughs> um, but uh, so she, she got retired and then they sent us a new one. And so this is it. Yeah. Oh, this uh, one's from Long Island too. Yeah. This one, yeah well, this one's from FDNY. It's actually up there. Yeah. But after yeah. that? It, it was from Long Island. Island. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. From the Terry Fund. So, but kind of miss these old rigs, you know, this is what I started on. You missed this yelling back and forth? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I didn't know the yelling back and forth because I was just, I was one of the guys riding back with right. back then, right? You couldn't hear shit. No, yeah. So <laughs> the officer would open the window and be like, hey! <laughs> you know, like, yell at you a little bit. Right, you know, sign language. Exactly. Yeah. Do this. You're like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and get off, have no yeah, idea. on the window, yeah. like, what do you want? I have no idea what he said. You know, yeah. <laughs> oh, but, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
it's crazy like the stuff we bitch about today and it's like we used to have to have the headsets on in this thing and just i can't imagine like riding the back it's so hot yeah. back there no and now like our uh, our captains and battalion chiefs we get these emails about all of the maintenance issues with apparatus right and every summer it drives me crazy that <laughs> these emails come out about the air conditioning not working and i'm like it's a work truck <laughs> it, come on you'll be okay yeah. Would you, you really would rather be in a reserve apparatus because your air conditioning is not blowing cold enough. Uh, if the air conditioning is so, working in the reserve, maybe. I, I, I know, but still. It's <laughs> they like, don't call it hot planet for no reason. It. I know, but you're only in it for like 10 minutes and then you're back at the station. Like, you can make it. It's okay. Yeah. So, but, yeah, it's, yeah, speaking of hot Atlanta, that's when, you know, shorts and the flip flops. It's like the first <laughs> week of the year that I've been able to do that so far. Yeah. It's just now starting to get warm post winter so try to try to do that as much as possible i get it man yeah. I, you you've actually broached the shorts flip-flop things on the show so uh, yeah. mike daly was the first to wear short because that guy doesn't own pants at all i don't think <laughs> uh, and now you took it to a whole another 11 ounce flip-flops and shorts okay so. good all uh, right so, yeah. well you know it's my southern california roots uh, yeah. you know and uh so i still have that it yeah people look at me like shorts and flip-flops but i'm like <laughs> I, I you know that's what you wear when you're from Orange County. You know, it's like one of those things. Like that's what happened. Just so you guys are aware, he was wearing a surf shirt when he when I first got him for this morning. I made him change into a polo, so yes. don't be surprised. So now, yeah, now I'm representing UL as a polo. <laughs> but sorry to Steve Kerber that I have shorts and flip flops <laughs> on, sir. But so I know that we met in California, and we I knew that you were from there. But where were you originally from? So I was born in Long Beach. And then uh, I went to high school in Norco. Okay. And uh, my parents and brothers still live in Norco. And then after high school, I uh, started Fire Academy, Paradise School, all that kind of stuff. I lived in Newport Beach for 10 years. And then uh, followed a girl to Atlanta and stayed with me. That's it. I've been here ever since. So I've been here since 99. And uh, yeah, so I'm going. I've been in Atlanta almost as long as I was in California growing up. So, yeah, that's, uh, so now, you know, after being here 24 years and, uh, you know, having uh, married, kids, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'm just finishing out here. I got five years left. Is this but, windy? Where do I got to turn? I got to take windy all the way down to, windy uh, yeah. Make a left here, Austin. Okay, that's what I thought. That's where you want to go, right? Windy Hill? Yeah. Okay. And then when I get to Windy, I'm making a right? Okay. I don't know right. where I'm going. Oh, we're going to Brewster's off of Cobb Parkway. Brewster's of Cobb Parkway. Okay. Yeah, like way down there. So. All right. Let's Sorry, I figured you'd know the area. Well, it's a big area. <laughs> so. Well, it's down by the hotel. So I'm making a right on. Oh, Brewster. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we went a little bit out of the way, but it's okay. We got some good talking in. So. That's okay. I. There's pretty much almost every episode I get lost somewhere. So, okay. Uh, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's just creative editing. There was uh, okay. the one that I was doing with Ben Martin in Nashville. He's talking to me about something, and I'm lost. And he literally looks over me and goes, you're not even listening to what I'm saying. And I go, dude, I'm trying to drive a stick shift fire engine that I've never driven before. I'm lost in the city of Nashville. Like, it's just classic. I love it. Now, uh, did you actually start Explorers and all that when you were in Cali? Yeah, so I was actually a reserve in the city of Linwood. Okay. And, um... And I went through uh, Daniel Freeman Paramedic School and all that kind of stuff. So I, I did my third rides with LA County, LA County 26s in La Puente. Right. Um, so finished up there and then was just trying to get on. It was in uh, processes, you know, you know how that goes, testing processes. Yeah. Multiple processes, standing in line for applications, all that kind of stuff. So what forced me out of California is I was living uh, in two different places. I was had to live uh, in the city of Los Angeles. So me and a guy were sharing a one bedroom apartment because I was in the LA, LA City process and they had that residency requirement. Right. 
so I was paying two rents. I was paying rent there in the city of Los Angeles, and then living in Newport Beach with my buddies, which wasn't expensive, but I was broke. Right. And I had met this girl, and um, she was like, hey, I got an opportunity to move to Atlanta. And so I was like, all right, why well, flew out here with her? Went into a couple of firehouses, and they're like, you're a certified firefighter in California and a paramedic. I was like, yeah, they're like, you can get a job wherever you want. Right. And I was like, skeptical, because like, it can't be that easy. You know, there's yeah. no way. Right. And uh, so, but turns out it was that easy. I was here, um, I moved out here, and within like 90 days, I had a job. <laughs> so, um, which, with you know, Cobb originally, or? No, I, so I tested with Cobb, and uh, was in their process, but their process was a little longer. And I got hired with Clayton County Fire Department, which is another metro agency just to the south of the airport. Okay. And um, so I worked down there for five years. They have ambulances as a medic. You know right. what you know what right. that means. So I spent a lot of time on a lot the ambulance down there. Yeah. yeah. Hey, listen, that that's a, that place is a very busy fire department. They go to lots of fires. So there's a lot of guys that work down there on those boxes that you get a lot of first team post line work. Right. right. So they love it. Like you yeah. get to go to fires. And so you get there, put out the fire, or do search, like do really good work, but then, then you get released to go back. You get released to go back. <laughs> right. But that creates conflict, you know, because the guys are like, hey, how come you weren't there cleaning up rolling hose with us? It's like, because right. the chief told us to leave and get back in service, you know? But um, yeah, so I got tired of that life. And, uh, and then Cobb, they were doing a lateral entry program at the time. Okay. And I had kept my application on file. They have this thing where you can just circulate your application. So every year they would call me and I'd be like, no, I'm good, no, I'm good. I want to go. And then finally they called me like, hey, we're doing uh, a lateral entry. Would you be interested? And uh, we have on record that you're a firefighter and, and a paramedic. And I'm like, right. yeah. So I was the very first lateral entry program in Cobb County. <laughs> and uh, I went to recruit school in 2003. So I just lateraled over. Our recruit school was like two weeks long. And uh, we just went yeah. from there, man. So. The first lateral and afterwards they're like, we're not hiring laterals anymore. So we all. did have some of that <laughs> issue um, because I think we got like uh, the worst people from all the other departments type of thing, you know? Yeah. But um, now we've gone back to trying to get some laterals again just for recruitment purposes. I, I think that's yeah. where everybody is nowadays. I mean, we can't you can't find enough medics. So laterals and hiring yeah. EMTs with non-medic, that's, that's like the norm now. Yep. All right, you said Bruce was on Cobb Parkway, right? Yeah, I'm from here. I'm good, dude. Okay. We're, uh, until I'm completely lost again, we're good for a while. All right. Yeah, we're going to go up to Cobb Parkway and make a right. Yeah. I know which one it is. It's right there by the Best Buy now. Yep. So, uh... Says it opens at 11. No, they're going to be there early. Okay. I paid, right. I paid extra. Okay, nice. All right. <laughs> I, I paid for the rig and I paid for the ice cream place. Nice. Okay, cool. Um... So what were you teaching at MAPSI this week? So this week I did a, uh, a class with Battalion Chief Kevin Lewis. Okay. We've taught it in several places, firehouse, that kind of stuff. It's a class called uh, The Pillars of the Fire Ground. Okay. And uh, the point is, is we're talking about search and fire attack, right? Like we get kind of lost, especially from where you're from, the West Coast, right? That first two truck is vent. Right. And uh, if you look at all the research that's out there, Ventilation should kind of be an afterthought until water's on the fire now. So we're trying to push, really getting people to have a, a search culture, search mindset. We've always been a fire attack mindset, like everybody right. pulls up and pulls that first two hose line, but it's really about getting in place and getting people inside the structure. So one of the things we try to say in our class is like on the pillows of our fire ground, our search and fire attack, and we're gonna flood the building with water and people at the same time. Right. So using some of that research to not be afraid of streams. So we we put people in windows opposite of hose streams and get trying to get people in there for the victims and get water on the fire as quickly as possible. One of the things we've done here is we got rid of the verbiage of transitional attack or exterior streams or hit a heart from the yard. Just get rid of that. Don't even say those words because it does cause hesitation. People right. see stuff on social media. So now we just empower our firefighters with a nozzle. Like, hey, this is your nozzle. When it has water on it, if you see fire, put water on it. Just make it that simple. Right. It takes away all the stigma um, of where you're standing. Right. So Whether that's from the outside or the inside. inside it doesn't matter. Just put water on it, right? Yeah. So, And so that's kind of our push is getting guys to get water on fire as quickly as possible because we know that not only is that better for the victims, you know, it's better for the firefighter, firefighter safety that operate inside. And we also know that 
we teach our people to do appropriate host streams, right? Like we're we are smooth bore and fogs, but our fogs are, are made sure that you're on straight stream and guys are taught right. proper technique so there's not going to be any you know that scary steaming pushing of gases that you could have opposite of the host stream right so we have people working inside opposite host streams all the time and uh if you come to the class you know i have some videos from actual fireground footage here in cobb you know that show that where guys are knocking down from the exterior and there's an interior line already going to the interior too plus people in there searching right. Right. and so as they're flowing water from the outside an interior stream will come blasting out the window and then the officer's like okay shut it down they're there you know so we're trying to knock things down as quickly as possible like whatever yeah. that takes um so that, i mean that's really our goal you know get water in the building as fast as possible and get people in the building to to rescue civilians and more importantly is once we do get those civilians is we have cyano kits and um and paramedics on all of our apparatus you know so we're getting people out into the front yards and getting treatment done on them and um and we've had multiple civilian rescues in the last few years since we've kind of changed these tactics right and successful especially with the cyano kits so it's one of those things that uh really started to kind of change the mindset within our department and um, you know because we do follow some of the research uh, I think people can think like oh they're a research department they're not as aggressive we actually look at the opposite of that we're more aggressive because we understand the fire dynamics involved we know what's what our limitations can be and you can be more aggressive smarter safer faster more aggressive on the fire round you know by utilizing research-based tactics yeah. and uh, you know I've, we're thankful we have a very good relationship with FSRI and Underwriters Laboratories. Um, they've been, Dan and Steve, Steve Kerber, Dan Matskowski have come to our department, had multiple classes here. We posted lots of things with, you know, basement fires class. Uh, we hosted a UL Fire Dynamics boot camp. We uh, did part of the coordinated attack study. Right. You look at the garden apartments that were burned in that, they were burned here in Cobb County. So. We've been very involved with them and have a good relationship with them. And, uh, you know, that has driven our department to be much better. You know, I, I mean, if you look, probably you could pull some data and you start looking at the civilian rescue piece. We know we have that already. We start looking at the amount of property loss that was there. I mean, we're not burning structures down. You know what I mean? We're knocking we're keeping them to room and contents because of our fast water. And uh, it's all about fast water on tank water, right. trying to be aggressive with things. So that's really what our class is about is, you know, educating people that it really doesn't take that much water um, and showing videos and fires of large bodies of fire that could be on the exterior, talking to them like this is just a big light show. Don't be scared of it. Right. Pull an inch and three quarter line. It doesn't get water take much on. water yeah. to put doesn't all that water, out. But you'd be surprised. You know, you pull up those videos and a lot of guys are like, okay, wait, who here would use a jet gun? There'll be <laughs> 10 hands that'll go up. You know, out of a, a group of 100 people, there'll be 10 hands to say, oh, yeah, it's a jet gun fire. Yeah. No, that's, that's not, just the know, smoke burning. It's not the front a, of the structure. That's burning. exactly it, right? So getting people to realize that it's just a gas that's going to put off, you know, that's on the exterior now. And it's really not a, it's the structure, the exterior part of the structure is burning. And getting people to realize when fire is on the exterior and running up the siding, that's the exterior that's burning. Exterior fire goes out with exterior streams. Right. But you see too many times where guys will go and they immediately push in and go to the interior. And then the outside it's still just getting burning. bigger and bigger yeah it gets bigger and bigger gets in the attic we burn the we burn the roof off of it and if you go back and historically look at things we've had line of duty deaths from fires that happened just like that you know right and uh, and that's tragic like it's hard to believe that a fire started on the outside and then killed somebody killed a firefighter on the inside yeah it's like what the heck are we doing you know so kind of missing some of those things and really driving home the point try to get people to you know, really get water on the fire as quickly as possible, get rid of the stigma. Um, and if you look at the direction that the research is headed, especially with the release of the new search study that just came out yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, so taking away the verbiage, like where we made a mistake in fire attack and using transitional attack, like that got a lot of people lost, right? Because transitional is one of those modes, right? right. An operational mode, an offensive or a defensive mode that incident commanders use. And we, we wanted to get rid of that verbiage. And so, like, you'll see things in the study where vent in her search, VES, is not in the search study. Right. It's called a window-initiated search. Okay. And it's not like they're trying to change anything. You know, that's what people are going to go, oh, they're just trying to change the books so they can write more books. <laughs> no, they're trying to be very literal about where you're starting your search from. So, VES is being called a window-initiated search. 
Um, so with that, you know, just trying to make things as simple as possible. And that was a, that's not you all just making that decision. That's done by a technical panel of 25 people from fire departments all across the country. So those 25 subject matter experts, they're the ones that decided on that verbiage. And, uh, you know, hopefully people, once that stuff comes out and gets released, they kind of start to realize some of those things. Um, that this is, UL doesn't make that stuff up. This is all decided by the technical panels right. and by the group of firefighters from around the country. Um, they decide what's best and how this should look. So, um, you know, getting people to realize that I think is important. You know, a lot of people throw it on UL and, and you know, talk bad about it, but it's really not. It's, it's actually the technical panels that are involved. Right. So, yeah, there's um, actually firefighters there too, not just the propeller guys. It's, it's, yes. Yeah. No, and that's the thing. So if you look at some of the guys that work for UL, like guys like Keith Stakes, right? So Keith Stakes is a battalion chief in the metro D.C. area. I mean, he's a firefighter. Right. He's just got an engineering degree and he works for his laboratory. So, yeah. I mean, he has plenty of fire experience. Um, and you look at, like, from the fire attack study and all the stuff he's been involved with, that guy's had more nozzle time than probably any firefighter in the country because of all the fires and all the research burns. Sure, they're research burns, but that's still time on a nozzle extinguishing fire. So yeah. that's he's probably the most experienced nozzle man in the country, and uh, he happens to be a research engineer. You know, so um, you look at that, and I, and I think the people that know him are like, okay, yeah, this guy's a firefighter. You know, he's not a propeller head. He's not one of those people. So. And then if you talk to people like Dan Magikowski, like Dan's going to tell you straight up, hey, listen, I'm not a firefighter, you know, right. I'm a researcher, and uh, I'm an engineer. Um, and so that's, they, they are very, you know, no bones about it. And, uh, and this is, you know, they designed the projects to model exactly what the American Fire Service sees. Um, and so, again, back to that technical panel, those guys decide what the burns are going to look like yeah. and what's the best way. and how operate you know how firefighters operate so like you guys like west coast not a lot of better research happens out there right that's kind of a, a forbidden animal in a lot of departments on the west coast and it's been part of your culture has been searching off of hose lines and things like that so taking guys from west coast departments to the east coast or even south um to departments that do vent and research all the time having those discussions of like hey listen we do it safely you know, efficiently, uh, and it's, it's a, a great tactic getting departments out there to kind of realize that. Well, that's one of the interesting things about the technical panel is because we vary across the country. We do the same job, we show up to mostly the same structures, and we fight them completely differently across the country, which seems crazy, right? right. I mean, you look at like what we're riding around here, and it's a lot of things that look like Ontario, California, you know, right. and it's like, hey, there's houses and apartment complexes and strip malls and have all the same building construction, and but we fight fires completely differently, yeah, just based off of our experience, and uh, and that's where the research comes in. It's like you can kind of take your experience, combine it with the research, then use that to make an educated decision. And that's you know that's what we've been pushing for. Well, I guess I started teaching at FDIC uh, 11 years ago now or something. Right. And um, and that was my message from the beginning, was trying to combine research and you with your experience and take that. Early on, you know, I uh, I took some meetings for sure. You know? right. I stuck my neck out there, especially with the exterior stream stuff. And I was the guy that wanted to fight every fire from the outside. I, at least I, I was nicknamed that, you know, but... Oh, that guy doesn't go inside. He only stands in the yard, and all kinds of crazy stuff said about you. And you're right. like, and now I teach that class at FDIC, attack from the burn side, and people are like, it's not controversial anymore. Now it's just like, oh, look yeah. at like, right. just do that now. So yeah. it's been cool to be part of that cultural shift and kind of see things develop. Um, and you know, other guys across the country that are national speakers that really spoke out against it years ago and now are, they were part of technical panels and have seen the research and have kind of developed and changed what they were saying um, and you know that's that's been fun to watch you know guys work for these you know, large urban departments that were completely against exterior streams and now they're out there at fire conferences talking about them and teaching it so 
talking about the way water works and water mapping and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, those are the pieces that, uh, that for me are like a little bit of validation. It's like, okay, we finally have come far enough that now it's not a controversial discussion anymore, you know? Um, but there's still some of the younger guys that come up, depends on who they're influenced by. Yeah. Here, Metro, Metro Atlanta Firefighter Conference, where we are now, I, I talked to some guys the other day from a, a rural department right outside of D.C., and uh, they're like, oh, no, I had a bad experience with exterior water. I was inside, and the stream came in the window, and it didn't feel too good. And I'm with John Cirillo, and Cirillo's like, you look like you have both of your ears. Your ears are still there. Did you get burned or anything like that? Did you have to go to the hospital? Oh, no, it just, but it was uncomfortable. And John's point was, think how uncomfortable it was for the person that's laying in that hallway waiting for you to put water on the fire. Right. Like, think about that person, you know, and that's right here. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. So... That's what we really have to think about is think about, it's all about the victim, right? That's our biggest thing as firefighters, we worry about the victim. So if we're so worried about the victim, get water on the fire as quickly as possible because you're only going to make things better. Well, you talked about uh, teaching at FDIC uh, 11 times now. Yeah. Uh, not this year. Well... I did teach hands on. I gotta hear year. it. I gotta so, hear okay. the story. So I made it my first two days. Of because I was gonna do firefighters on scooters getting ice cream, but I figured yeah. you'd kill me. I know. I know. I could have totally done it. I could still ride a scooter. I'm good. <laughs> I think my wife would kill me if she saw me on one. But you know, we won't talk about that. Part. Okay, I gotta. So, I gotta hear it. All right. So uh, yeah. So yeah. You know, in, if you go to Indianapolis, go to FDIC, you're gonna see hundreds, if not thousands, of firefighters <laughs> on scooters everywhere. So a safety message, scooters are dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I think it says they, that right on the scooter. I think it does say that. Yes. I think you actually have to sign a waiver. You're when supposed you to wear a helmet app. on those things, yeah, too. Nobody has a helmet. No, nobody has a helmet, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so anyways, we had, you know, uh, at, we were leaving the bar, and uh, I had to teach the next morning. Um, and so it wasn't a super late night, not even really had a night of heavy drinking. But just happened to be dark and didn't see the curb that was going up over into a crosswalk and went through a green light. And man, it was just that simple. It's not that yeah. exciting. I like to tell people that I was trying to be Tony Hawk. I was trying to do actually an Ollie kickflip. Yeah. You know? yeah. You're a California guy for sure. I, I can totally see well, it. And people fell for it. I was like, yeah, you know you Tony Hawk is, right? And they're like, yeah. I was like, so I was trying to be Tony Hawk on a scooter. That's not really what happened at all. It's kind of boring. Uh, I did just hit a curve, man, and flew off. And when I landed and got right, I got right back up, I got up and I was like, oh, man, I feel some ribs moving in there. That's kind of weird. I definitely broke a rib. Right. But then I'm not having any shortness of breath at the time, so I felt like I was good. You know, <laughs> I'm good, man. Got back on the scooter, rode a mile, mile to the hotel. My buddies are there, and I get there, and they see a little blood running down my from my uh, forehead here. They're like, what the hell happened? And I was like, I fell back there, you know, admitted. So then they're laughing at me like, oh, you dumbass, blah blah blah. You know, <laughs> right. making funny, typical fireman, you know, BS. And so we're laughing, taking pictures in front of the scooter and everything. And then I'm like, oh, don't make me laugh. My ribs are killing me. And they're like, oh, you want to go to the hospital? I'm like, no, I'm fine. It's broken ribs. Can't do anything for it. I'll right. suck it up. I'll take some ibuprofen. I'll teach my classroom in the morning. Everything will be fine. Lay down. A couple hours later, I wake up and have a shortness of breath. And then I laid there for like an hour trying to talk myself uh, into the fact that I wasn't really having shortness of breath, that I didn't actually have a pneumothorax. <laughs> right. right? And uh, so I was lying to myself. And finally, I laid there for an hour. That was so short of breath. I had to get the guys who are in the room with me and like, hey, man, let's go. You know, I, I, you got to get me up. And so they stood me up, got my pants on me, and uh, I was in so much pain when they stood me up that I actually passed out. I had a single episode. Wow. And then and they're freaking out. They're going to call 911. And I'm like, no, just get me in a chair. <laughs> so they drug me out on a desk chair, got me in a van, took me to the ER. And uh, next thing you know, I get to the ER. And yeah, sure enough, four ribs completely displaced, snapped in half, like almost like flail chest-like, um, punctured lung. And I got the trauma team over top of me. I'm getting a chest tube. And uh, and then four and a half days later, uh, I'm still, so all of FDIC was my spent in the hospital. So while everybody else was out having a good time at the restaurants, I was hanging out in the, uh, in the hospital, in Eskenazi hospital in Indianapolis. And then you uh, couldn't fly home. Can't your, fly home. Your wife and, had to come drive and pick you up. So that wasn't a super fun phone call <laughs> to call the wife to, Hey, I need you to drive from Atlanta. I know it's an eight hour drive. Can you come get me in the hospital? Right. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure on the way home, you know, I got muscle relaxers and pain pills so i'm like trying to sleep i got pillows and like suddenly like every time it felt like i fall asleep and then you hear that Rah! you know she's like oh sorry i was just looking at my phone i'm pretty sure that was purposeful you know she, <laughs> she's uh 
She's not super happy, but uh, you know it worked out anyway. So I had to take about thirty minutes of pure grief, but <laughs> the, the rest of the seven and a half hours after that turned out to be okay. It's crazy. But, yeah. So yeah. So it's all good. Everything's healed. Well, the ribs aren't healed yet, but uh, hopefully I'll be back on the rig in four to six weeks. Well, you were like originally like high on my list to do the show this week, and Kevin Lewis is like, I think he's dead. Yeah, so, I was like, and then I see you at a bar. I'm like, he's a risen from the dead. Oh, yeah, a lot, a lot of people thought that I had died. <laughs> and, uh, I know even at FDIC they announced that uh, like the Fools Bash, like Bobby Halton was up there, and he's like, it's okay, Sean Gray's alive. He made it. So, uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it was a serious injury, and uh, you know that's one of the things. Like seriously, take scooters. You know, everybody thinks that they're you know not that dangerous, but yeah, they can be dangerous. That there's like an indie guy that broke his neck. He's like out for months, you know, with it, wow. and then yeah, a pu- couple people hurt ankles and shoulders and everything else. So I'm um, waiting for the next FDIC where the like the thing comes out for all the instructors. Like we're paying for you to come out here. Yeah, you're not allowed to register. Well, you know, I joked with the FDIC people. They sent out the thing for mileage reimbursement of the instructors, and I replied <laughs> back to to Ginger, <laughs> Diane, and Bobby, and said, "Hey, can I get reimbursement since I had to ride home with my wife?" Of course, joking, you know. Right. And then they laughed. She said she'd scooter me for the mile or send me the mileage for the scooter. <laughs> I was nice. like, "All right, great." Are you ready for some ice cream? I'm, I'm always ready for ice cream. Let's do it, dude.